attacked and they're a victim and they're entitled. So it's just this one segment of whiners on TikTok or something that pops up because they don't want to face the fact that they got to control the person in their mirror. Well, y'all tell me, are we just a bunch of whiners? Is there really no bubble? I mean, honestly, I think there's a bubble 2.0. And I'm going to show you guys information that shows you what I believe is beyond a shadow of doubt that Dave Ramsey is wrong. We're not fools. We're actually smart people. And it's never been a better time to rent when comparing to buying. But regardless, I'm going to show you guys what is a housing market bubble. Let's revisit what that even is. Now, the thing is, guys, is despite what a housing market bubble is, we're also going to talk about what happens if the stock market crashes. That's not really something that we've talked about on this channel. So we're going to go over that as well. Because the fact of the matter is, is we have every indication that is spelling out for us that we have a housing market bubble. It started to deflate a little bit, but overall, it just got worse. And on top of that, the unaffordability going on right now in America is almost un fathomable. And real quick, before I begin, wanted to give a special shout out as usual to Jason Walter. I keep shouting him out because I really appreciate that man. I want nothing but the best. He helps me with all of my editing. If you guys need help editing, reach out to Jason Walter. His info is in my description. Jason, appreciate you, brother. Love you. Let's get into the article. Oh, and if you guys learn anything, please give me a like, give me a bonkers below. But let's start here. Four out of five Americans still say it's a bad time to buy a house. Again, I wanted to start here just to show you that America, thank God, is waking up with 80% of people and buyer sentiment saying, nah, we're not going to buy right now. Maybe the other 20% is watching Dave Ramsey. And I'm wondering, what is that 20% holding on to? We have payments that are historical high. We have PE ratios that is historical high. We have limited amount of options. I mean, this is an extremely toxic housing market. Despite what we hear in the headlines, we can tell that consumers are starting to wake up when they stop spending and they start saving. That will be when additional pressure is put on prices on the prices going down. Just to paint the picture of unaffordability, this is the national payment to income ratio sitting at 36.1%. That is not counting the skyrocketing property taxes that blindsided people and the skyrocketing homeowners insurance that is also blindsiding people. But regardless, we're sitting at record highs, way higher than the GFC. But when we really dig into the percentage increases of property taxes and homeowners insurance is way worse than it even says here. But one paragraph I really want you guys to pay attention to. Under current market conditions, it would require some combination of more than a 3.4% decline in the 30-year fixed rate mortgages, which would bring them down into the 3% again, and or a 49% raise. So we all get 50% raises. I like that and or a 33% decline in home prices. So this is saying from an affordability standpoint, keeping up with the 30 year, 30 year guys, come on, 30 year average, okay? Homes are overpriced by 33%. Now this is a really epic article that came out yesterday that's called Understanding Housing Bubbles. Okay, so let's just go back in time and let's just refresh our memory. What's a housing market bubble? right? What is that? Let's see. And I think that Business Insider does a great job at explaining that. Starting with what is a housing bubble? A housing bubble is a steep run-up in home prices. Okay. So, so far, do you guys agree that so far that's what we've had in you know the 2020s post-COVID? Steep run-up in home prices. It's defined by its ability to pop. Eventually, whatever is driving demand will collapse. And suddenly there is no demand, which means that housing prices will begin dropping rapidly. So what is, was driving demand, you guys? What was driving demand during the run-up? Interest rates in the 2 and 3% and free government print and free government handouts. They were printing money into our bank accounts and we were just getting money from the government. So obviously that is what pushed forward demand. And a lot of that demand we would have had the you know these last couple of years, which was pulled forward. Okay. And now you guys, all of that has changed. People are running out of money. People will start saving money and they will stop spending. Now let's continue. There is no one cause for a housing bubble. However, they're always caused when the housing market moves away from the fundamentals that it's based in. Century of based in this, usually by some temporary external pressure on the housing market that boosts demand. 
You mean like lockdowns? Here's a look at the conditions that typically lead to a housing bubble. I mean, come on, you guys, this is literally what's going on and what has happened recently. Starting with a rapid rise in home prices, a housing bubble is primarily marked by a sharp price increase in real estate. According to Housing Wire, prices are disconnected from fundamentals and that demand that's being pushed by housing is of speculative nature. And we have overwhelming speculation right now, not only from new home builders, but also from investors, especially short-term rental investors, Airbnb, things like that. Now let's take an example. The housing bubble in the mid 2000s, at that time, lending standards were incredibly loose. And when rates go down to 2%, it makes it incredibly loose as well in a different way. And it was easy to get a housing loan. Again, just like right now, 2% drops DTI and free money anyways, which created unsustainable demand for housing. When credit standards tightened, demand shrunk and prices fell. Speculative buying and fear of missing out. And again, historical, we've never had a worse fear of missing out situation and we have never had more investors purchase homes. You guys, this bubble is worse in my opinion than the GFC. Speculation can further drive the housing market away from fundamentals. Thank you, Pace Morby among others, though it doesn't have the force to create a housing bubble on its own. When real estate prices start climbing, speculators might see an opportunity to ride that wave and buy into the real estate market. That's still going on right now. These property investors limit housing supply and raise prices even higher and further away from fundamentals. Exactly what just happened. Next, unsustainable demand. Hasn't demand taken an absolute beating? Yes. Yes, it has. High demand leads to a run up in prices and often encourages more housing construction. Well, that's good for satisfying demand at the time. Once the demand eventually wanes, and it will, as it always does, it makes the crash even worse. Then there is a glut of supply and not enough buyers leading to even steeper declines in home prices. Now, signs of a housing bubble. There are typically signs you can watch that indicate a housing bubble is happening. Now, the first one is right here, you guys, obviously skyrocketing prices, outpacing income growth. Real median household income has gone down since 2019. We don't have the updated 2023 numbers yet, but real adjusted for inflation income has been going down as prices have skyrocketed at an alarming rate. One concerning indicator is if housing prices are rapidly outpacing income. Again, like now, housing demand grows when income grows because people have more disposable money to put towards a down payment. Again, stimulus printed in our bank accounts. That's more money for a down payment, agreed? If income isn't growing, but housing prices are, then something else other than buying power is pushing demand. That could mean a housing bubble is at foot. And again, we had 2% interest rates and we had money printed into our checking accounts. You guys get it? Another cause, loosing lending standards. You know, I'll tell you guys, I was a loan officer during the GFC. There was incredibly loose standards, specifically income verification. We could just call that right there. Income verification and down payment requirements were very loose. Fast forward to today, it's a lot tighter in that sense. But what loosens up lending standards? When rates go from 5% to 2%, it loosens lending standards because the debt to income ratio or the qualifying ratio drops as well. And it drops significantly, thus opening up the gates of demand. Again, when we go to 5% to 2%, it opens up the floodgates of demand because on top of the low rates, there was also lockdowns. So there was all these lockdowns and then people just sat, demand got higher and no one was selling. And so there was this rush of buying demand that got completely out of control. But now lending standards are finally starting to tighten. Here's a big indicator right here, you guys, increased construction activity. I mean, I'm literally driving around the nation, East Coast, West Coast, and I'm showing you guys there's an overwhelming increase in construction activity and the activity is underreported, greatly underreported. In fact, we have a much worse situation happening now than what's really being led on by these home builders. We see that in their stock prices. Now, this is interesting, guys. This goes on to talk about how housing bubbles burst, okay? So compared to other economic bubbles, housing bubbles are uncommon. And that's why so many people are confused on what happens next. We've, what, had essentially two times in history, the Great Depression and the GFC, where the entire nation collapsed. 
It's very uncommon. This is primarily because housing is so expensive. So it's not subject to a great deal of impulsiveness, except when rates go down to 2%. Do you guys agree? When they do burst though, the consequences can be huge and far reaching. Here's how this typically happens and what it means for consumers. Isn't this a cool article? So the first thing it goes into is triggers. So interest rates and economic downturns. Anything that would hurt demand can trigger a housing bubble to burst. Did y'all hear that? Anything that would hurt demand can trigger the housing bubble to burst. So why hasn't that happened already? One of the reasons, again, and I keep saying this is, the money, there's so much money printed, the low interest rate, golden handcuff effect, it just takes time, it's inconsequential when it happens, because we already know from history and from the facts and from the data that it will happen. It's only a matter of time before the inventory catches up, people stop spending, they start saving and everything falls apart. We see this in delinquency rates surging for one thing. Now it goes into explain rising mortgage interest rates, for example, could be a trigger as they make buying a home more expensive and may discourage buyers from entering the market. General downturns in the economy, widespread layoffs is one industry or market or other issues that can trigger the burst. So stock market burst, right? So isn't the stock market overvalued? And then unemployment, we haven't even started a recession and yet unemployment is only 3.9. You guys, and that Number 3.9 is manipulated by government jobs and deficit spending, by the way. Price corrections and falling demand. First of all, we have historical falling demand, and we already have price corrections in many metro areas. So we have writing on the wall, guys. Let's read what this says. A housing bubble pops when whatever was pushing demand suddenly evaporates. Signs of a housing bubble burst include sudden abundance of supply compared to demand, exacerbated by both speculation and new homes on the market. So what are we missing? We're missing that overwhelming demand, but we are close. Before lockdowns, we were shy about 200,000 from where we're at right now. So roughly-ish, about-ish, 200, I'll say 200 to 300,000 not 6 million, 300,000 guys. And the trajectory is skyrocketing and it's just the start of the season. This is gonna be a great year, as long as you're prepared and you have your guard up, let's finish. That causes a drop in home prices because people are willing to sell their home for lower and lower. Eventually, demand and supply reach an equilibrium. When a housing bubble pops, the general consensus is that if you're able to hold on to your house, you should wait to sell it until after the market has stabilized. Don't forget that guys. And in fact, to be honest with you, and I've said this before, I really don't believe in selling real estate. Okay. I don't believe in institutional investors. I don't believe in owning hundreds of properties, even 20, 30 SFRs. But I definitely think that as American consumers, we should retire with maybe three houses. Do you guys think I'm a bad person? I mean, I really want to know what you, th I, I don't own multiple houses, first of all, but I'm thinking three. I think three, I don't know. Is that a good cap? Let me know what you think. Foreclosures and economic impact. When a housing bubble bursts, the aftershocks can be huge. In the mid 2000s, it caused millions of Americans to lose their homes. It didn't actually. It caused millions of Americans to have foreclosure filings, but those led to loan modifications and short sales. The actual foreclosures was roughly 300,000 and the foreclosures didn't start you guys until recession. So you can't tell me that we don't have a majority of the things that we just read in that article. And so again, we're not just doomers. When it's time to buy real estate, I'm going to be so bullish, you guys. I want to be the best realtor in Houston. I want to make a million dollars in commission. But right now, it's not the time. I've already had a foreclosure repo bankruptcy in a $100,000 tax lien filed against me during the GFC. I kept my head in the sand the last time. I was a professional. I was a prodigy. I was making so much money and I missed all of this. I kept my head in the sand. The only reason that I woke up is because it knocked on my door and said, Travis, you lose everything. Goodbye. Foreclosure, bankruptcy, repo. It took me years, almost a decade to crawl myself out of the gutter to get where I'm at right now. Excellent purchasing power, I'm disciplined, great spending habits, no consumer debt. But you guys, you guys don't have to go through that pain. And if you're a young kid, if you're you know, a young millennial or millennial, you don't even know what an overpriced house is, okay? Take it from a millennial, I'm an old millennial. Take it from a millennial that lost everything. The prices of houses right now, way overvalued. And when you are forced to buy some crappy house, 
trust me, you're going to regret it. You're going to wish you stayed renting because your landlord fixes everything. Now, let's ask the question, what happens when the stock market crashes? The stock market crashing can be an extremely bad thing. In fact, some people say the reason for this recent small boom in real estate in 2024, which has been killed, by the way, is because NVIDIA is because the stock market has been doing good. When the stock market does well, people get money, people spend that money, the economy does well. But again, what I'm saying, most consumers are already broke. And when more and more job layoffs happen and that rumor goes around and those facts go around, people are going to stop spending. People are going to start saving. The economy will go into a doom loop of destruction. We don't, we're not even talking about the CRE crisis, commercial real estate. But regardless, let's go into the stock market. Let's ask ourselves, what would happen? I think this article does a great job at explaining that. It will be linked in my description. Now, the immediate fallout. Okay, so again, this is this is asking basically the impact on the economy if the stock market crashes in 2024. These are some pretty cool reads today. Now, the first thing is, is immediate fallout, consumer confidence craters. When retirement accounts and investment portfolios shrink, people naturally spend less. And remember, most of the growth and activity in the housing market is coming from the rich and the boomers. So if their portfolios suffer, the housing market's dead. I mean, that's literally the only area of growth left in the housing market is if you already have money. So that's one thing. Now, the next thing, guys, is corporate profits will plummet because it's a doom loop, right? So businesses face a shrinking customer base leading to a drop in demand for their goods and services. This translates to a decline in profits, forcing them to reevaluate their expenses, leading to the next thing here, which is layoffs loom. And this is just talking about the stock market crashing. Okay. To manage the costs, companies may resort to significant job cuts, further dampening consumer spending as laid off workers tighten their belts. We can see this in Tesla. We see this in Tesla, guys. And now the next thing is, is a credit freeze. That's why I'm saying you guys need to build your purchasing power now. If we enter recession, if the stock market crashes, it's probably going to be harder to get a loan. Listen, it's going to be harder. So you have to be strong right now. Now, now banks spooked by the volatility and uncertainty may become more cautious about lending. This tightening of credit availability can stifle investment and hinder business growth. Startup companies and small businesses, which rely heavily on loans for expansion, might be particularly vulnerable. We see that already happening right now without a stock market crash. Retirement insecurity. Again, we see that right now without a stock market crash. So people will become insecure that are facing retirement. Now take a look at this, guys. Long-term repercussions. So stock market crash could actually lead to recession. And that would make sense since, again, the rich are getting richer right now. So we need the rich to lose money. How else am I supposed to say it? Recessionary risk. So long-term repercussions, recessionary risk, a severe market crash coupled with a drop in consumer confidence and investment can push the U.S. towards a recession. And don't forget, our savings is at record low savings. We're at 3.2. People aren't saving. They, they're already spending money right now. I mean, this is crazy, you guys. This can lead to a prolonged period of economic hardship impacting everything from unemployment rates to housing markets. Now, second bullet point, government intervention. This is a scary one. So the government did intervene in 2023 in March, and they started something called the Bank Term Funding Program, which stopped the spread and contagion of bank runs. All right. That happened. And that was very scary. That was extremely scary. It actually hurt my soul. And I got a lot of ridicule because a lot of people were are not really paying attention, looking at headlines, looking at the surface, they're not going deep. And they're like, Travis, you were wrong about everything. But none of them is you know, mentioning the government intervention and what that intervention did. And so again, you guys, that's scary, but this could incentivize spending on infrastructure projects or tax cuts. And this would, again, incentivize businesses and consumers. However, such measures can lead to higher budget deficits. So they're doing it right now. So they're intervening right now. All right. So what happens when the stock market crashes? What happens when the housing market crashes? I mean, this is some scary, scary stuff. And I know that the stronger we are right now, the better prepared we will be to make it through whatever happens next. Now, the third bullet point, shifting investment strategy. And this is important. In the aftermath of a crash, investors may become more risk averse 
favoring safer assets like bonds over stocks. And that's why we see also the inversion of the yield curves. While this is unsustainable, it can impact the flow of capital to businesses, hindering long-term economic growth prospects. Businesses rely on investment for expansion and innovation, and a risk-adverse market can stifle these crucial activities. Again, that's already happening right now because of the QT, quantitative tightening. This is crazy. All these things that are happening, again, it's absent a technical recession. It's absent like technical unemployment. Yes, the labor market's weak. Yes, the economy is weak, or we wouldn't have a deficit. This is crazy. So the question is, is what's the silver lining? Well, what I'm saying is, is a lot of times we're going to find the buying opportunity of our lifetime. If we situate ourselves right now, we may make a killing. So again, the silver lining is a market correction. A crash, though painful, can be a natural market correction. Not this nonsense Keynesian philosophy. And Jeff M., ugh, I love him. He's basically saying that the new normal is the, is the Keynesian economics in our economy. And I'm saying that's, well, the consumers can afford that, but that's also not natural to the way our economy works. Now, it can weed out overvalued companies and pave the way for a more sustainable future with stronger, more fundamental sound companies taking center stage. This can lead to a healthier and more resilient market in the long run. So hopefully that happens. But the second thing here is the important thing, buying opportunities. Savvy investors may view the crashes as a buying opportunity, snapping up stocks at discounted prices for long-term gains. Same thing with the housing market. That's what I'm saying. But if it's your primary residence, maybe you don't want to invest, but I'm simply saying that that's possible and that you should consider it. The last thing, guys, is government reforms. I really don't want to get, go down that path because I'm so disgusted at all of the fiscal and monetary policies that we've passed in the last four years. I want you guys to consider a couple more things about this housing market bubble. As it pertains to credit tightening, this and let's talk about delinquencies and let's talk about mortgages, the six month mortgages. So all mortgages that have originated within the last six months, you guys, those defaults are skyrocketing with all levels of loan, conventional, FHA, VA, and they're at 10 year highs. So the delinquency rate for new homeowners, not the 2022, they have equity, they have low rates, they can sell. I'm talking about the people right now that are rushing buying houses. That is skyrocketing. Now that puts an overwhelming amount of pressure on re specifically regional banks. If they have just one person with one late payment and generally the first 12 months of that loan, they get charged back all of their profits. So in addition to these banks suffering with no refinances, historical low purchase volume, they're also getting hit on the back end servicing because they cannot keep people paying their houses on time. And what that's going to lead to is the credit tightening. If we didn't have this Keynesian deficit money printing situation continue after lockdowns, we would see this so clearly. But unfortunately, because of this Keynesian, let's stay comfortable and keep printing money philosophy, the bubble is just bigger and the price is more severe. Now, it's just a general breakdown. There's obviously many more things that we can go into. Everything's going to be linked in my description. Do me a favor, though. Seriously, how do you guys feel about what I just read? I mean, we covered a lot of basis right there. I really want to know. Share with me what's going on in your market. All right. If you're going to comment below, just again, comment below. Give us your intel, but tell us your market. All right. There's so many different markets. Remember, you guys, it's about localized markets. It's about subdivision. But we also look at macro data because macro data will eventually make it to subdivisions. Now, other than that, guys, if you're out there investing in real estate, you know that I wish you luck and I hope you win.